Well, hello there, motherfuckers, and welcome to your WrestleMania 33 review. So already I'm laughing my ass off. I post my Roman Reigns Undertaker video. The show is so fucking long, so fucking long. Watching five hours, I also watched the pre-show matches, six hours of wrestling. Fast forward through the talking. Six hours of fucking wrestling to watch this fucking show. I watched not just, I didn't fast forward anything on the main show. From start to finish, watched the whole show. And I, I enjoyed it actually quite a bit. This was one of the best shows I've seen from them in a very, very long time. And um, what do I want to talk about here? I don't want to like, you know, uh, kill the enjoyment of when I, when I talk about the match later on in the review. But the response to my opinion on Roman Reigns and The Undertaker to the result of that match, I was, you know, I know I expected like some people to tell me that I sucked because I had a difference of opinion. Because you see here in the YWC... A difference of opinion is like life or death. The YWC will cast you out into exile unless you worship fat motherfuckers like Kevin Owens and worship uh, worthless weirdos like Sami Zayn who have deep affections for taxi driver, you know, uh, uniforms and shit. I don't fucking know. By the way, where was Sami Zayn? Oh, that's right, he was on the pre-show. He was on the fucking pre-show. So people are losing their minds over th this show. You know, um, a lot of hypocritical shit. We're not building new stars. A new star is being built, but they don't like that particular star. This is exactly the reason why WWE should never listen to the fans. Do not listen to these fucking morons. I'm also going to do my Raw review as well, where I'm going to talk about just how it fucking annoying these fans are. Anyway, what, let's start off with the pre-show as an added bonus. Neville defeated Austin Aries to retain the Cruiserweight Championship. This was a pretty good match. Um, you know, I enjoyed it. I like the heel tactics of Neville. Uh, they have, haven't done shit to try to tell us who Austin Aries is. But this is like a complaint that is going to fall on deaf ears, of course. It's kind of worthless complaining about wrestlers not having characters. It, it, you know, you've got people who are world champions who don't even have personality. So complaining about a cruiserweight not having a personality is kind of a, it's a wasted effort. You know, I'm not going to stand here in the video and complain, so we'll just say it was a good match. You know, we'll satisfy the smarts. You know, I like Austin Aries. I like the new attitude of Neville. A guy like Neville should be the king of the cruiserweights. I mean, look at the guy. He's Jack. You look at a guy like Jack Gallagher, and you look at a guy like Neville, and you also look at Aries. You see the build on Aries, and you say... You know, these guys are, like, not even in the same league. These are guys that go to the gym who hone their craft in their bodies. And meanwhile, guys like Jack Gallagher, that's why they're not on the fucking show at all. Because they're fucking worthless. Take it, that fucking umbrella and shove it up your fucking ass, you fucking umbrella-carrying penguin wannabe weirdo. Just talking about him gets me fucking upset. He's not even on the fucking show. So I like the little eye rake there with Neville to get out of the last chancery. Um, hits him with the... Um, um, with the... Uh, what do you call it? The fucking... I can't even think of the name of his fucking finisher. What the fuck is it called? Uh, anyway. Oh, the, uh, the red arrow. There you go. Anyway... Mojo Rawley wins the fucking Andre the Giant Battle Royal. Why? I don't understand this. Why is he winning the Battle Royal? I, I could have sworn it was going to be Braun Strowman. All well, that makes it less predictable. Like I said sometimes, sometimes it's better if it's predictable. It makes more sense. You know, he's a giant. You know, he's a tall guy, he's a tough guy, he fit right in with all the other winners. You know, like Big Show, 
and uh, Baron Corbin. And by the way, isn't it funny that Baron... Oh, I'm not even going to... I'll save it to the next match because it's the very next match on the pre-show where I talk about Baron Corbin and how pathetic it is. So you had uh, one of the New England Patriots. They, you know, they get in the ring. They argue with Jinder, or they try. He tries to get in the ring with Jinder Mahal. Um, then he actually ends up getting in, beats up on Jinder Mahal. Mojo Raleigh uh, gets him out, and there you go. I don't know what it was, but it's like, you know, they're not going to do anything with Mojo Raleigh. We all know this. We, we know that they're not going to do shit with this guy. He's a nobody. Um, you know, he tries to have a bit of charisma. But, you know, they're not going to do... They're not going to... They haven't done shit with any of the fucking winners of the bow. You know, the Big Show's already done it all, so he doesn't really count. But they haven't done anything significant. Nobody who's won this battle raw has went on to win a world title. That's what it should really mean. The person who wins this battle... I, I thought that this is what it was supposed to be for. I didn't think it was just, you know, like to have a notch in your belt. I thought when they came up with this concept back at WrestleMania 30, that this is what it was going to be. You win the battle royal and then you're going to be the guy who gets pushed for the rest of the year. But then you had them dancing around with the pre-show. Basically, let me put it this way. Pre-show means you're not good enough to be on the main show. Let's just not dance around it. It's pre-show entertainment. It's preliminaries. It's the same thing with the UFC. You know, no one cares about the prelims because obviously if they were meant to be cared about so much, they'd be on the main fucking show. So your winner is Mojo Raleigh. Like, there's nobody better like Braun Strowman to give it to, or they could have given it to that guy from NXT who nobody knows from Insanity. They just throw these guys in there. The only person who gets an entrance is is, is fucking Big Show. And um, Braun Strowman also got an entrance, I believe. So Mojo Raleigh... This guy just comes out with everybody else, basically. So, when he wins, it's kind of like, oh, okay, well, he was just one of the guys walking down to the ring. It was kind of, it's like the same thing with the Divas Battle Royal that was at WrestleMania 25. Everybody comes out, you don't even know who's who. You can barely see the faces with the camera pulled back, you know, so it's like, you can't even fucking identify half these people in the Battle Royal. Like, who the fuck is... That fucking fat guy in the thong. Oh, that's the guy from Insanity. I, we don't even know who he fucking is unless we watch NXT. But now then I'm going to get a whole bunch of YWCers on my back about, you know, I was on Facebook. I'm talking about NXT with, with uh, Cameron Morales. And we're getting attacked by people for saying that nobody cares about NXT. Well, we're not going to get into that right now. That's a story. That's a video for another day. The next match, Dean Ambrose. Remember Dean Ambrose? Last year he was world champion. Hey, remember that? World champion, Dean Ambrose. Remember that guy? You know, beating Rollins and Reigns. Remember that? Remember him as the world champion and ate with AJ Styles? Then Baron Corbin, this guy won the Andre the Giant Battle Royal last year. Remember? And he spent most of the year feuding with fucking Sin Cara and a feud that went nowhere. Remember that? And then these guys were in the Elimination Chamber fighting for the world title. Where are they now? They're on the fucking pre-show! Mere months ago, Dean Ambrose. Dean motherfucking Ambrose. This motherfucker was world champion. He was world champion. And now, where, where, where is he? He's on the fucking pre-show, for God fucking sakes. They, I don't know what it is. First... They tell us this guy's a lunatic. He's the lunatic fringe. Oh, okay. How come he doesn't do anything crazy? He makes a couple of crazy faces. That's about it. I've ranted on that enough. We're not going to get into Dean Ambrose's character. But we'll talk about Dean Ambrose's credentials. Dean Ambrose was a world champion, right? So what the fuck is he doing on the pre-show? He was good enough to win the world title. And, and who said it first? Who said that this world title run was going to go nowhere? Who said it? Me! 
While all of you were saying, WWE is saved! I'm the guy who's always standing there saying, no, it's not. Samoa Joe's here, WWE is saved! No, it's not. I keep saying it time and time again. Finn Balor's here, WWE is saved! No! WWE's not gonna be saved, you fucking morons! Every single time one of your favorites wins the world title, they put a fake belt on a guy you happen to like. They put, fuck this shit. Remember, motherfuckers, I'm the YWC champion. Remember that, folks. I'm the YWC champion. YWC champion. You got that right. And there's a reason why no one has been able to take this belt from me. This championship. I am still the reigning, defending undefeated in every single fucking argument that's come my way. I am still your YWC champion. And this is why I like Roman Reigns so much. Is because, just like him, we're hated champions. We're hated all over the YWC. That is why I like Roman Reigns. The man knows how to take the, the hate. He doesn't let it get to him. Just like me, we're just hanging back and enjoying life. Living large, baby! And we don't care what you Nimrods think when you whine and crying about our opinions and our way of doing business. We do business the way we see fit, and we enjoy life. <laughs> yeah! But that's, that's the way the cookie crumbles. So Ambrose beats Corbin. This match will be forgotten just like... Just like Dean Ambrose's title run. Ha <laughs> ha! Anyway, in the yeah, it's a shame because I like Corbin a lot. I do like Ambrose. I never said that I didn't like Ambrose. I've said it time and time again. I said the guy's got a lot of potential, but it's not my fault that he looks like an average Joe off the street. It looks like they took a bum, just a, a bum, like somebody came to uh, you know to fucking Times Square or some shit, got a bum off the street, cleaned him up a bit. And made him into a WWE superstar. That's all it fucking is. He looks like an everyday schmo. The main show, let's get down to actually WrestleMania. The people they deemed worthy of being on this show. And it was a good show that I enjoyed thoroughly. Mainly because it had an, uh, an old school feel. That, you know, obviously, why do you think guys like... Samoa Joe and Kevin Owens didn't even get close to headlining the show. Sami Zayn, nowhere to be found. Finn Balor was healthy. He was on house shows, but they didn't put him on the fucking card. They could have slid a little match in there at the last minute. What do you What do you think that it wasn't Finn Balor? For uh, um, you know, Finn Balor, you know, could have beat Kevin Owens right instead of Goldberg. It could have been Finn Balor. Headlining against Sami Zayn. Because they fucking know that them vanilla midgets can't sell shit. They couldn't sell food to a starving person with $10 in their pocket. With those types of fucking matches. That's the metaphor you're going to get right there. That's how bad it is. Starving person wouldn't even... You get what I'm saying? Anyway, the main show... Shane McMahon and AJ Styles. This was pretty long, but it was good. Um, you know, people are saying that Shane McMahon, you know, hung with AJ for too long. A guy that's, you know, like a decade older than AJ. And he's hanging with him and he's taking AJ to the limit. I could see those arguments, but I enjoyed the match a little bit too much. You know, it, it, it was a good match. Shane McMahon is very talented. And one thing, though, that I didn't like that was a recurring game on this show was AJ hit the Styles Clash on Shane. And I would have been happy if it ended right there, but the thing was, he kicked out. I don't really like that. Shane McMahon kicking out of AJ Styles' finisher. I know that AJ likes to use the phenomenal forearm. That's more of like his main finisher, but even still, kicking out of the Styles Clash... No, I, I, you know, that's going a little bit too much. Shane McMahon should not be kicking out of any big moves. He didn't hook the leg. He didn't have both, you know, legs over him when he did the, the Styles Clash. But that's fucking bullshit. You know, kicking out of that, that move, 
if you're trying to tell a story and trying to sell these finishers as finishers, don't have them kick out. But it was a good match. Uh, Kevin Owens defeated Jericho, um, you know, to win the U.S. title. This was a pretty good match, but really it was like my least favorite match on the show. Uh, you know, there's there wasn't really anything too special. I mean, it was a good competitive match, not, nonetheless. Jericho does his usual losing at Mania, as per usual, you know, always losing at Mania. You know, I guess it's better than losing to Fandango, for fuck's sakes, but... No, I don't know. But this is the thing. After all the shit with Kevin Owens giving him the world title, and now he's got the U.S. title. Dean Ambrose has got the IC title. Kevin Owens with the U.S. title. It's like they give him a trial run with the belt. The trial run. It lasted months. lasted like half a year. And then all of a sudden they're like, yeah, we'll just give him the secondary belt again. It's almost like moronic. You know, like they go backwards. Now, I know you can make the argument that even Jericho had won the IC belt after he was the undisputed champ. Triple H, when he was in the power trip with Stone Cold, he'd already been a multiple WWE champion. He won the IC belt. But that was a little bit different. When you take a look under those circumstances, it was a little bit different what, what they had going there. You know, they had so many main eventers and so much to choose from. Sometimes it was like... They had they were just doing things to keep them relevant. They had so many different storylines going on, but now there's really no fucking excuse of why these guys with a thin roster with barely any stars and it's not like, you know, Kevin Owens shouldn't have even won the world championship. Kevin Owens is a talented guy, but the guy's gotta get in fucking shape already, because it's like a fucking joke already. These people are booing Roman Reigns. And they're cheering Kevin Owens when people should be... You want to chant something? Chant to Kevin Owens to go fucking eat a salad or some shit for fuck's sakes. My God, this guy eats a fucking pack of Oreos before he comes out as a pre-match ritual. That's what I hear. I, I, I mean, come on. The guy drinks a fucking gallon of soda every single day and then downs a fucking package of Oreos and you people are not commenting about this? the fuck's wrong with you people? He's a fat fuck! Anyway, decent enough match. Bailey defeated Nia Jax, Sasha Banks, and Charlotte in a fatal four-way match. This was a, you know, this was a decent match. That Nia Jax gets knocked out of it very early. I don't really get why uh, they just dispose of her just like that. They ganged up on her. I get that. They ganged up on Nia Jax. That's the reason why they were able to eliminate her that easily. Have her stay in the match. She's a big threat. I mean, I, I would have liked to see her go right to the end. You know, with uh, I wouldn't buy Bailey beating Nia Jax. This was kind of like I I, I don't get how they they book Nia Jax. I'm still thinking back to that NXT. Event where where Asuka, Ahsoka, whatever the fuck her name is, the Japanese girl, she gets like a leg drop on the back of her head and she kicks out of it. Like, she would have been crushed, the little Japanese girl would have been fucking crushed under all that weight. This like 300 pound girl. And somehow she's able to continue to match. It's like the same thing, it's not even believable. Three, three of these girls ganging up on her, I, I get it, but... You know, if they want to make her a true monster, stop having her lose all the time. Have her, like, get some wins in. This is what I don't get. We're not we're not going to buy anybody as a monster if they lose constantly. But anyway, you know, it's Bailey, I, I still can't get over this with the, her being champion. Such a, a, a goofball. Just the, I don't understand how she has so many fans with the side ponytail and everything it's almost like she's inspirational for like for idiots for, for retards they make her like you see her face and she just lo looks like a total moron and this is like she's supposed to be this inspirational figure for little girls it's lame it's stupid you know and mostly it's 
it, it's it's people in their twenties who are fans of Bailey. I'm a hugger. It's like, you know, you got to be kidding me already with these people. You know, the guys who are big Bailey fans give me a fucking break. They give Charlotte such a hard time, and you see, like in her matches, like it's not even. How it would be like booing the heels. They're just always giving her a hard time anytime she tries to cut her promo. I said this months ago. And she's obviously the most talented one there. She's the one who looks like a star. She's the only one who looks like a star in the ring besides Nia Jax. And, you know, it's. It, and I felt a lot different about Sasha Banks. I'm like watching her out there. And I'm almost like, you know. I'm not even buying her as a star anymore, really. I see her, and same thing like Bailey. She looks like a little girl. You know, it, 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 she doesn't seem like she would be on a grand stage like this. Charlotte, now she deserves, now they should have never taken the belt off of her. Why, you know, out of all these people you look at, you see that Charlotte looks like the champion the most. They they take away her undefeated streak. They have her do this thing. I believe that she's only been in the, when she she first won the belt in uh, in 2015. And she's already won the belt four times already. That's a little bit fucking ridiculous. I, 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 you should have instead of having her win the belt that many times, she should have just been the champion for all this time, maybe losing it once, I can see that maybe, if they wanted to give somebody else a try for a little bit, but you look at Charlotte, it's almost like she should be like the female Undertaker, she should be unbeatable basically, until somebody could really come along and give her a challenge, like Nia Jax for example, they should have made her like Ric Flair was in the NWA. Make her like her father, like practically unbeatable, or, or seemingly that way. She might not be the biggest dog in the fight, but as far as, you know, charisma-wise, she definitely is. Just not understanding all this rage. This is just giving in to the fans because they like Bailey. They like to buy her hugger t-shirt, which is, first of all, if you're, you know, older than, say, you know, 15 years old and you're wearing a Bailey Hugger t-shirt, you've pretty much given up on life, let me put it that way to you. If you're going to walk around in public with one of those Hugger t-shirts outside of a WWE event, God help you. God help you in your mentality. That is sad. But one thing, a, a girl wearing it, but what a man with a Bailey Hugger t-shirt. Holy shit. I mean... That shows you that you've got some immense problems there. Um, you had the Hall of Fame ceremony. I'm always puzzled. Like, no one ever seems like they give a shit about DDP. He comes in during the Royal Rumble. Maybe it was just me. Maybe I'm one of the only few people left that still like DDP. Maybe, the you know, the, the fans, like the real wrestling fans, the ones they call the casuals who have gone far away now. Maybe those are the people that respect the DDP, but they don't even cheer for DDP. Um, if anything, Teddy Long got a bigger response than DDP. That's sad. Kurt Angle got a massive response, which I was happy to see, but then again, it's like because he was just in TNA, these fans watch every single promotion under the sun, so they know, they know Kurt Angle. Kurt Angle, um, got a, a massive response which was good to see and we would see later on what would happen on Raw um, you know so it's good to have Angle back in the fold you know and this is definitely a guy who deserves the Hall of Fame you look back at you know Kurt Angle's run and, and that's just what you call a successful one Kurt Angle always looking good for the most part even during his goofball stage you know he was always a you know, always entertaining no matter what the guy did. He was very flexible. You know, he, he did a wide range of things when he was with the company. Definitely a role model. Um, you know, maybe he could come in there and, well, who am I fucking kidding? I always say this, that, you know, maybe they could change something. It's going to stay the same. It's just going to be the same shit 
with built, you know, with Kurt Angle involved. That's all it's going to be. The Hardy Boys return for the Fatal Four Way Ladder Match. Um, sadly, before I got, you know, I got to see the show, I saw on social media already that the uh, Hardy Boys had returned. But if I was watching the show live, this would have been something I, I wouldn't have expected. I would think that they'd probably have New Day come out there and, you know, and they were just going to announce themselves. It was a good fake out. Michael, if you notice when they came out, Michael Cole said WrestleMania is about to get broken. The mount, now, Matt Hardy still had the uh, broken that hair. Jeff Hardy had pretty much removed all of his brother Nero makeup. So, it doesn't look like they're going to go with the broken storyline. I don't know if that shit is copyrighted. It might be. They're, they might do something similar to it. But chances are, why do I get the feeling like we're just going to have the Hardys and that's it? Like, which is a real shame because as we have seen throughout, you know, Matt's career and that they could do a lot with Matt Hardy personality-wise with version one. You know, Matt Hardy always seemed like he was on the cusp of doing something big. And then they would always knock him back down. And, you know, Jeff Hardy, before he last left the company last, he was already a main eventer. But, well, I get the, you know, the thing is what leaves a bad taste in my mouth is the Dudley boys. There's no reason why the Dudleys should have been treated the way they were. These guys were legends. Now, the difference is I think the Hardys are even way more popular than the Dudleys. They seem like they're getting a bigger response. Uh, so it's more than just being a nostalgia act. And the difference is they couldn't wait to put the tag titles on the Hardys. The Hardys debuted, they debuted, uh, re-debuted at, at WrestleMania as opposed to the Dudleys where they just came in, you know, after a random pay-per-view. It was SummerSlam, I remember. And they, they just spent their time, their tenure there just doing fucking nothing. You know... They were supposed to be there to help put over the younger tag teams and help them. But I, it might go a little bit better. But I would just say, please do something a little bit original. You have the Hardys now. You know, they, they're, they're still at a decent age. They're not, you know, super old yet. They're not Undertaker or Triple H's age yet. You can still do a lot with the Hardys. You have them now. Take advantage of it. Just please do not make them just another tag team. You know, just don't make them bland like American Alpha. Just like, oh, these guys are just a great team and that's it. That's all you're going to do with them? Do something, you know, that, that takes a bit of creativity. You have the Hardys now. Do something with them. Just don't, like, keep putting them out there with just... Because I, I could see it with Raw. You know, they just put them out there. They have the rematch and... They're just treating them like they're just another tag team. Not enough fanfare to go with them. They're, see, TNA knew after a while when the hearty shtick of them just being athletic was getting old. So that's why they, you know, you had Jeremy Borash coming up with this uh, this brilliant broken gimmick that was getting so much attention. And I, but I don't really see it happen. This this was another good match. Jeff Hardy wasted no time. Doing a swan time on the outside through a ladder. Uh, they're back in full effect. It was a, a big surprise. It's very, very long awaited. I mean, it's been, it's, what, what has it been now? It's been eight years since we've seen Jeff back in WWE. It was 2009, last time we seen the guy. He's back again. Matt Hardy, 2010. It's been a long fucking time. One of the last times we saw him, he was toppling over the top rope. Um, now he's back again. It's, it's great to see him. Just I'm, I'm begging, please, please do something with these guys. Don't just, you know, like I said, treat them like they did with the Dudleys. Like they're another interchangeable tag team. You've got the next up with Cena and Nikki Bella defeating the Miz and Maurice. 
Nothing really too special here, but I don't really think anybody was expecting this. Cena was going to have another big moment. It would come after the match. He proposes to Nikki. Um, this was a, a good moment. You know that Cena's probably going to take some time away now, obviously. Uh, you know, it's kind of weird, though, seeing Cena in big matches, and then all of a sudden, nothing. You know, they, like... It's really like, it was like a nothing match. You really uh, didn't, you know, you didn't get a lot out of Cena. After all these years of watching Cena in these big matches, all of a sudden to see him just, you know, in a mixed tag match. That's why it was a little bit strange to me when this was first announced. I didn't think they were going to go with this format, but they did. And, well, it made sense in the end why they would do it. The Miz did a good job, you know, uh, making fun of Cena, and so did Maurice, making fun of Nikki when they were doing their skits on SmackDown. Um, they weren't as hilarious as many other people were making them out to be. But, you know, it, it was decent for what was needed to build up to it. So, yeah, uh, good moment at the end there, you, you know. It's another mania moment for Cena in a different vein, but still good. Uh, then you had Seth Rollins defeating Triple H in a non-sanctioned match. And here's what really bothers me here. Not that this wasn't a good match and everything, and Seth's got all the talent in the world, and Triple H really held his own, and I like how he was working over the leg. But there were so many times in this match where... Seth Rollins just simply shouldn't have been able to get up anymore. And it, it really was, you know, Seth Rollins is going into this match. In reality, he was sick. They said not only did he have to sell this leg injury, but in real life he had the flu. He had a 103-degree fever. I don't even know how the hell, you know, it's like they, 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 they're forcing him into the ring. It's mania, I get that, but holy shit. Going in there with a hundred and three fever. Not only that, but he, he's selling this this injury, the right knee, I believe it is, and you know Triple H is working over the knee. He's putting it in the the Indian death lock and shit. He's working it over, and and it, Seth Rollins keeps getting up and he's do he, and he keeps using the leg to kick. And then he gets on the top rope, does a phoenix splash, landing on his knee. And it's almost like, okay, he, he's selling the knee. He's holding the knee. He's showing that it, it's, it's you know, pain. And like, I know you're going to say it's like, you know, Brad O'Reilly already. It, it, it's fake. He's selling it. You have to have a, uh, you know, you have to suspend your disbelief. I get that, but then again, there had been so many, including Triple H, who would actually go the extra effort to sell injuries and in matches to make it more believable, because it just looks pretty fucking stupid that he's trying to, like, be careful on his leg, but meanwhile, the, the dude's flipping all over the fucking place. And, not, he's, and he still he remembers to sell the leg, but the thing is, he shouldn't be able to climb to the top rope not only that, but kick with the leg, kick with the other one at least. I, I don't know what it is with Seth Rollins. I, I don't know what it is with the guy. There's something that keeps me from totally loving him. Maybe it's the fact that he's not careful in the ring. Maybe it's the fact that he's injured a handful of people. Or maybe it's the fact that, like, you know, they want to make like he's the best. But really watching this match, it's like he is a talented guy because he's athletic. But... It's like he doesn't understand the concept of a match. It's like back in the day, you would not see Stone Cold. You wouldn't see Mick Foley, like, you know, getting up doing these huge big moves if they're trying to sell an injury. That's one of the big staples that I don't think anybody gets when they watch these matches. Is psychology is a big thing. It's Because like I said, it's like, it's like a movie. We all know just that the movie's not real, that it's fake, but it's their job to try to make it look as real as possible. And when you watch this, it really just looks like a comic book. It, it, it looks like a silly action movie, you know, where you've got an explosion, somebody's getting shot in the leg and still walking. It's like the same thing. 
It's, it is like Seth Rollins is getting his legs destroyed. He should be like crippled at the end. And, and Triple H is, 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 is working over the leg. He's working it over, working it over. And then he, do, and then he does the pedigree. Landing on his knees. And, and, and again, you know, goes right for the cover, no selling. It's just like he doesn't understand the psychology of a match. You know, yes, you, you, know, you remember to sell, but you shouldn't be able to even do those moves because you're supposed to be injured. That's the whole concept of the match that, he, that they're going in with is that he has an injury. So you, you shouldn't be able to get up to the top rope to two of Phoenix Flash. Anyway, I like the spot Stephanie going through the table. Um, you know, they, like I said, complaints aside, a good enjoyable match. You can't say it was a bad match. They did a lot. Um, Triple H and Seth Rollins went through a, and this was a pretty long match. This was like 25 minutes, which was a thing here. The opening match, this match, my God, it was so fucking long. It took forever for me to, to watch this show. Is why I'm doing the review now, like so many days later, because it's it takes so damn long. It's like I can't say that we're bad, but you, you know they've extended WrestleMania now to uh, a, a length that is just ridiculous. It used to be a three-hour show, not even three hours, watching WrestleMania 13. It was like two hours and 45 minutes. I remember WrestleMania 17. It was a big thing. They were going to move it up to four hours. And at the time, I was like, well, okay, because, you know, all the other shows are under three hours, and WrestleMania is the biggest one. So let's go ahead and just... Give it an extra hour. That makes a lot of sense because it's a big show. You probably want to extend it. No one really had any gripes with that from what I remember. There wasn't really an internet around the time when they came out with that, you know, any big wrestling community. IWC was very small. So it, it seemed like a pretty, you know, sensible thing to do. But now... Every, now they've increased it. There, and there hasn't been any official announcement to this. It was always four hours. But then when we noticed that the main show was mostly like last year we noticed it. It, it, it started creeping up to five hours. And this one went over five hours. You look at it. I looked at the end. It was five hours and ten minutes. How intimidating is it? I turn on WrestleMania and the thing says like it's over 300 minutes. I'm looking at it, I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Do you realize that you could watch like two or three movies in that length of time? I mean, that is like pretty fucking outrageous. And then you tack on a, a pre-show? A pre-show should, you know, they keep on doing this. WrestleMania has got to be grand. It's got to be big. I get that. It's got to be grand. It's got to be big. But it, it shouldn't take up the whole goddamn day. It used to be like the Super Bowl of wrestling, but even the Super Bowl doesn't go on that fucking long. It's got a, you know, a huge fucking massive pre-show. Add it all together and you've got uh, seven hours, like almost creeping up almost to eight hours. But pretty soon you're going to have WrestleMania is going to be ten hours long. And the problem is, and you're going to see a lot later on this card that, well, the very next match, Orton and Wyatt. There was nothing wrong with this match. And people were saying like it was a bad match or something. I liked the effects. I was surprised by that. You know, they, they had like the buck, the bugs like on the uh, on the canvas. You know, they, they put that video down from the top down. It made it feel special. It played into Wyatt's character. But the crowd was dead for all of it. And meanwhile, you've got JBL sounding really goofy. Oh, the crowd doesn't know what to make of it. And the fact that he kept on repeating that just made it worse. It was like, shut the fuck up already. We all know that the crowd's not reacting, but by you harking on it and constantly repeating yourself. Really, what happened to JBL? I remember when this guy was commentating. Um, he, he was fantastic, like back in 2006. The guy w w was phenomenal on on uh, on commentary. 
very enjoyable. And he was always, he would always make good comments. Now this guy just, through every single uh, show, he's just making a whole bunch of stupid comments and these observations that are just so obvious. Okay, yeah, we know that the crowd's not reacting, but by you keeping it up and, and keep on pointing our attention to it, it's drawing our attention away from the match and we're focusing on the dead crowd. Now, the reason why the crowd is dead for this match, I don't think, is because it's not that they don't want to see it, because they're fucking tired. Leading up to this match, they, they had matches that were like 20 minutes long. Well, Triple H was like a half an hour long. It's too much already. It's too long. They, they need to understand that, you know, okay, we want lengthier matches. I get it, you know. Maybe, but the thing is, it's like sometimes it's too long. And, and the fact that, that these guys can keep going, everybody on the roster is like, you, you know, like, like has all this infinite godlike stamina is just not realistic. The, the, these are true wars and everything. The fact that Seth Rollins with an injured leg is able to go a half an hour, I, I, that is just, that's a fairy tale right there. That's not a real story, as I said. And every single match having to be 20 minutes, going close to 20 minutes, they could have easily shaved off a lot of time and it would have made more sense so long that by the time they get towards the end of the card, no one gives a fuck anymore because they've been sitting there, their ass is probably falling asleep, their minds are falling asleep, people are probably literally falling asleep, not because it's boring, but because it's just sitting there for so long, it's like doing something and just shut down eventually the people only have so much energy then you uh, so Orton wins here and I really don't have a problem here with that I, I, like I said and people gave me a problem when I reacted to his win the elimination chamber I said this is not going to work it's just not going to work and people were telling me oh well it's it's better late than never and I was like, better late than never. How about just never? At this point, when Wyatt has been beaten down so much and it just comes out of left field, all of a sudden he wins the title. I'm like, I was just like, you guys saw. I said, bullshit. This was a belt that he should have won three years ago, not a month ago. It makes little to no sense to just throw the belt on him. This just was for the purpose of the storyline. And that's why I even said in my predictions bit, I said Orton's going to win it, without a doubt. And I don't really have a problem with that. Because as far as credibility, Orton has way more than Wyatt. Is that Bray's fault? Of course it's not. It's creative's fault. But really, like I said, it, it, all these guys on the roster, you give all the shit to Roman Reigns. It's not his fault. It's creative's fault. They have to come up with stuff for these guys. They, you can't just... All these guys are basically thrown out there and they're supposed to be responsible for getting themselves over. That's impossible. You need to help these guys out. You give them these shitty scripts and you and you expect these guys to get over. The way I'm creative is no one's going to get over. And, and that's why it looks ridiculous. You know, now uh, you've got somebody like Finn Balor at the top. That just shows... How they have no creativity. That's why they just go with who's popular now. They get who has the most cheers. Because the fans, you know, they don't, they're not even given any direction anymore by creative of who to like. Because everyone is so boring. So they're just going to gravitate to who does the most flips and who does the most retarded shit. You know, Finn Balor. <laughs> you know, that, that that's what, that's now what fans want to see. They... They, they like that nonsense. It's not even about, you know, credibility anymore or character or charisma. There's cause there's none of that anyway, so they have to gravitate to all the other nonsense. Anyway, um, but it was a good match. It's just, like I said, no one's going to remember it. It was a forgettable world title reign. Now Orton's the champ again. You know, uh, the YWC is going to complain. They're saying that, you know, uh, Wyatt deserved to keep the belt. Why did Bray Wyatt deserve to keep the belt? 
Can somebody explain this to me? When the world title means so little that the fact that a guy like Dean Ambrose, Dean Ambrose, who was world champion months ago and he's on the pre-show, does it even matter anymore? This guy should have won the belt back in 2014 feuding with Cena. You know, they, they, uh, they got cold feet. They can't just come back years later and start making up for lost time. In order to do that, they would have had to be a bit more creative. And they don't have that in them. So, this, this was a stupid idea to make him the world champion at first. And as you can see, nobody was buying it. And it was a little bit of both. Nobody was really buying it too much. And next, it's mostly because of where this was placed on the card because they had this huge marathon show and everyone is all tired out by the end of it. Lesnar defeated Goldberg. This was a great match. It was under five minutes, but holy shit, it has to be one of the best matches I've seen that went that length of time. This was um, just, you know, a, a nice quick brawl. Goldberg looked strong. You could say that all he did was hit Spears and all Lesnar did was hit German suplexes, but somehow it worked. Basically, we were all looking for something better than WrestleMania 20, and it was better than WrestleMania 20. And it even, even though Stone Cold wasn't the special guest referee, it felt like a bigger match. It certainly did. You know, the size and the scope of the event, you know, the, the arena. The, this was a really good, uh, you know, like apology, you could say, for that terrible fucking match back in 2004. It's long overdue, 13 years overdue, but, you know, we got it. Lesnar is the champion. I don't know if he's going to be a more active champion than he was when he first won the belt against Cena. But, um, you know, I guess we're going to find out. You know, how long is he going to hold on to it? I would say at this point, you better just keep the belt on him. And please, please don't get any bright ideas of having Finn Balor beat him at SummerSlam or any of this shit. Please do not even try to attempt that. If, any, if anybody thinks that's a good idea, just keep it quiet. And just stop yourself from sounding like a fucking moron. Because I, I, I know I know that they're going to try to maybe attempt to get that. I mean, we were supposed to buy Dean Ambrose against Brock Lesnar, for God's sakes, last year. We were supposed to accept that as a credible match. So I would not be surprised if they try the same with Finn Balor. Um, but... It's a, you know, it's a good thing. I already said people thought that Goldberg was going to stick around. I know. This is why YW, YWC needs to listen to me more often. I think I know what I'm talking about. I predicted this one accurately. Um, then you, uh, so, you know, try to listen to me for now on. There's a reason why I'm the YWC champ, for God's sakes. It's because I get a lot of things right. Um, I, I always tell you when something's not going to be good. I always tell you when something's not going to be bad. And you trash me at the end of the vid, but then always as time progresses, you see that I'm right all the time. You know, but go ahead, keep on bashing me, keep on calling me a sellout. We're going to get to that eventually. Up next, you had Naomi winning the six-pack challenge. I don't know how anyone's supposed to give a fuck. At this point, it seemed like more people were, um, you know, they came alive for Goldberg and Lesnar. They were a little bit more alive for Naomi's entrance. It was a great entrance. And I forgot to even comment. Triple H's entrance on the bike. The entrances were on point tonight. Um, all of them were good. You know, they, they put, no one could really match them when it comes to spectacle. That, that is why WrestleMania is on a different level. This is why people that don't normally watch, watch WrestleMania. Because it's it's just, a, it has that grandiose feel to it. And they definitely did it justice tonight with all the entrances and all the effects. 
Um, so you had Naomi coming out, and, uh, you know, she did her whole light show. It was like an extended thing. You know, she ends up winning the, the SmackDown women's title. It was a pretty decent match. It really was, you know, a nice, fast-paced match. You know, they, all the girls got to do their thing. Um, you know, decent enough. And then we had our main event. It kind of feels weird, though, that the women's match comes after one of the world title matches. Uh, you know, it happened at WrestleMania 18, but the main event was not a world title match, which makes it feel even more odd. Anyway... To the main event, Roman Reigns and The Undertaker. So many people, they you already know my opinion on this match. I said it was a good thing. If they were going to give a last match to Taker, many people argue. And I, you know, I could see the argument, have Taker win right off into the sunset. I get that. But you also had, you know... A problem here with Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns needed something to really get him over big time. And, you know, th this is definitely one of the things that they wanted to do. And, and also the other thing is, I think we all know that Undertaker is not going to, at this stage in the game, is not going to do anything that he doesn't want to do. So he wanted to put over Reigns. So are you going to really stand there and complain about something that Taker willingly did? It's like the same thing when he lost to Lesnar. Everybody whined and complained and cried. But this was Undertaker's idea. He came out and said it was his idea. So if it's his idea, then what the fuck is everybody complaining about? If it was his idea, and he willingly did it. It would be different if this was at a different stage in the game. And, you know, he was still, you know, thoroughly active on the roster. And McMahon forced him into it. Then you could see that you could, then you could criticize the ego of McMahon. And you could say it wasn't right for Taker. But now it's kind of a little bit silly that you have people sitting around complaining, crying their eyes out. I've never seen this. People in their 20s, in their 30s crying their eyes out, complaining about Undertaker losing a fake match. And, and, and not only that, but like going on and on about it, like it's a tragedy, like they lost a family member or something. And you can see, you, 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 look, you look at my video, you look at the comments on there, and it's just sad and pathetic to see so many people reacting in such an emotional way, a bunch of snowflakes reacting in such a negative just completely irrational manner I mean it's just ridiculous it's sad it's depressing it's a bunch of losers are complaining about a wrestling match that didn't go their way and this is these are the same people that McMahon sadly listens to nowadays why we're stuck with fat slobs like Kevin Owens and and nobodies like Sami Zayn and complete jokes like Finn Balor. That's why we have these guys. Do you know that people were actually suggesting, and you know that this is true. Let me say first what people were um, were asking for. They they, uh, they they wanted Finn Balor to wrestle The Undertaker and they wanted Taker to put over Finn Balor. Now, okay, so this is what they wanted. Now, if that happened, you fucking know that the YWC would have eaten that up. They would have praised Taker. They would have praised the match. They would have said that it was the best thing since sliced motherfucking bread. And you know that that's true. A hundred percent grade A truth right there. The YWC would have had no complaints about Finn Balor going over Taker. Never mind the fact that Taker's about, I don't know, a, a foot and a half taller than him, and maybe 120 pounds, uh, 120 pounds heavier than him. You know, small things. People would have eaten it up, and that's what kills me about it. You would have had no problems 
with a guy like Finn Balor going over Taker. But you have all the problems in the world with a, you know, a guy like Finn Balor, who looks absolutely like a nobody. You know, he puts on the paint once in a while, and, you know, that gives him a little bit of character. You know, but then again, anybody could just, you know, put on a mask and all of a sudden have personality because, you know, he's doing something out of the ordinary. Oh, look, I'm putting the belt on my face. I have personality. I mean, come on already. At what, at what point do we really break through the smoke screen and see that it's a bunch of bullshit already with the YWC and why do I constantly keep bringing them up? I'll tell you why, because it's it's simple fact of the matter is that this is who that they're this is who they're listening to now. These are the these are the the, the people that now run the show basically. You see that basically all the time all they want to do is is listen to the fans. They're cheering for uh you know, for Finn Balor. He's gonna get pushed all the time because of those cheers they love him and the thing is it's like everybody else has been tuning out the when, when they had Finn Balor their ratings were dipping below two million they were getting these record low numbers and still they still continue to listen to these halfwits still continue to listen to these utter morons thinking that they know what's best for the product when really this multi-million dollar company needs to fucking realize that listening to a bunch of goofball losers who have no sensibility and no intelligence and if, and if you told them to write a show they, all they would do is, is, is write fantasy matches and just put, you know, they would be happy with uh, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn every single night until the end of time. That's how they would write a show. They put all their favorite guys over. They wouldn't really look at, you know, uh, who the audience wants to see, how they can get uh, new fans. They wouldn't know anything. They don't know their fucking asses from their elbows. And these are the people that they want to write the show for. You've got to be fucking kidding me. No one, you know, is enjoying this product right now. Except for these... And I don't even know if these... these these halfwits in the crowd are really enjoying it. Half the time, they're booing, they're catcalling to all the wrestlers, they're trying to ruin promos with stupid chants, they're chanting CM Punk through half of it, and we see the response from the YWC. I, I, I do a video on the CM Punk chants, I say how it's wrong, how it's heckling. I say you wouldn't go into a comedy club and heckle a comedian you didn't like, unless you were, you know, a, a fucking lunatic. And you and you would see the you saw the outpour of people coming to the vid and telling me that I was wrong that fans have freedom of speech, trying to use something that they know nothing about in their defense. Freedom of speech, really. So people would agree with just you know um, saying anything that they want, no 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 matter how outrageous it is and how stupid. They, do you realize that when you're in a, a place like this, a privately owned establishment, that you don't have freedom of speech? You're on somebody else's turf that you're supposed to behave in a certain manner. You know, these people are here to entertain you. And instead of being, you know, wanting to be entertained, you're just there to entertain yourselves. You could basically sit home and do that. But no, you want your 15 minutes of fame. That's what's sad about it. You'd rather see yourselves get over on TV to have your voices heard than actually see one of these wrestlers actually do well. That's why every single time WWE gives you what you want and you just chant CM Punk. You chant CM Punk over uh, you know matches that you want to see. WWE gives you what you want to see and what do you do? You, you come up with a bunch of stupid ass chants. Please, so this is why... I even enjoyed the match even more with Roman Reigns putting down The Undertaker. Because it was just, it was refreshing to see that the YWC did not get their way for once. That they were still going to push Roman Reigns, and that Roman Reigns deserved it because he worked hard. He did. 
I'm not going to lie. I, I said in the past, everybody was saying, oh, you criticized Reigns in the past, you're a sellout. And, and it's funny because in the same video, I even mentioned that. And people gloss over that, and they don't even want to mention the fact that in the video, I mentioned that I criticized him, and I still stand by a lot of those criticisms. When he first won the belt, he was poorly booked. He's been poorly booked for pretty much his whole career. But to say that the guy is a bad wrestler is a retarded thing to say because obviously he's not. He had many good matches. He had a good match with the Big Show, which is almost impossible for anybody to do. So, you know, every single time Reigns has a good match, you've got these halfwits. What do they say? They go ahead and they say, oh, well, he got carried. Okay, yeah. So it's the same thing in this match. There was a spot with the tombstone, and one dumbass is saying, oh, Roman Reigns fucked up the spot. Okay, well, two people are responsible for one spot, so why just blame it? on Reigns and not Taker as well. Maybe it was both guys. Maybe it was Reigns. Maybe it was Taker. You don't fucking know. Were you in the ring? It, you know, but they're just anything that they want to do to try to make their, their argument, you know, listen, this is the way it's going to go. Reigns is going to get pushed. You don't like it, don't watch. This is, you know, the same thing of why I don't watch regularly anymore. The show is booked like shit. So I'm not going to watch all three hours. I'll skim through it. I'll watch the YouTube videos. But everyone's going to still just sit there and watch the show anyway. If you think it's such a problem. You all knew that Reigns was probably going to win. I wasn't 100% sure. But he ended up winning. And so for you to have a problem with that, when you were expecting it and you knew it was going to happen, and you're getting mad at me calling me a sellout, uh, how exactly does that make me a sellout? You know, can somebody really explain that to me by liking the result of a match? You know, saying that it was healthy for somebody's career, that it would help him out. Is, you know, uh, somehow, some way, this is considered to be being a sellout. I said it once, and I'll say it again. I didn't sell out. I bought in. <laughs> The YWC screwed the YWC. Long live the Roman Empire. <laughs> anyway, good show. In fact, a really good show. Um, I enjoyed it immensely. I, I, I thought everything was really top-notch on here. I give it like an 8.5 out of 10. Very close to a 9 even. The whole way through his entertainment, there wasn't a bad match to be had. The spectacle, the entrances, everything was good. My God, the entrance ramp must have been one of the longest ramps I've ever seen in my life. It took them forever to get to the ring. Undertaker's entrance took fucking a day. It took like a goddamn week for him to get to the ring, but, you know, it's all part of the spectacle. Anyway, good show. Um, to everybody saying I'm a sellout, just go to hell already. I, I, I mean, honestly, you, you know, you're, you're posting all these comments, you know, say, uh, disagreeing with my opinion. You've got to be fucking kidding me already. Grow the fuck up. If you can't take somebody else's opinion, don't watch the vids. Don't go on YouTube anyway. I don't understand this. The YouTube is full of opinions. If you don't like differing opinions, then watch the people that you know that you're going to agree with. What, what, you know, why come to me if you know most of the time that you're not going to agree with me? And, and, and you know that I'm going to be honest with every single thing I'm going to say. This is what I never understand, whether it's wrestling, politics, or movies. You already know you're going to disagree with me. So save yourself the trouble and don't watch it. That, this is what I keep saying. I, I understand that every single topic I do on this channel, if people disagree and they have such a problem, and they, and they think I'm such a moron, so, you know, and they can't stand it, why do you insist on watching or commenting? I don't know what you're doing if you're even watching the video. Half the time, it's almost like I think people just comment. They don't even bother to watch the video. They do like what they do with the news. They read the headline, they read the title of the video, and they just assume. They watch a minute of the video, and they assume. I don't I don't know if people are telling them things, whatever it is. They, 
they, you, you make up your own assumptions, and that's what's scary about people. They make up their own assumptions, so whatever. Vid's gone on long enough. Mania was a good show. I do like the result with the Taker match. Yes, it was sad at the end. No, I don't want him to retire. Yes, I do agree that maybe he should have retired undefeated, but he was already defeated with Lesnar. So I guess, you know, that that's kind of a losing argument. But whatever it is, I enjoyed it. So fucking sue me. It's, it, it, it's the thing that's like when I did Batman versus Superman. I enjoyed the I enjoyed the movie. I make a review about it. I say I enjoy it. People who disagree, people who disagree, instead of disagreeing with me and saying, okay, I disagree with him, and then, you know, people can't handle it. So instead of doing the smart thing and watching a video where, you know, you had countless other videos where they were just knocking um, Batman versus Superman, instead of doing the smart thing, they go away, they, they, they stay on my vid. They don't go to the video that, that has the negative review. Instead, they come to my video that has the positive review. I'm talking about how much I like something. It's not like I'm even being a super negative guy or anything, saying that, that it's bad. You know, so uh, I'm getting attacked for enjoying something. What, what is that going to accomplish that makes, it, that makes you feel good about yourself, I suppose? Oh, I hate this movie, so I'm going to attack this guy. It's going to make me feel better about it. Does that maybe, does that make the movie better for you? I don't understand that at all. Go watch the, all the reviews of them bashing. It's the same thing. There's countless videos on YouTube of people bashing the Roman Undertaker match. I'm praising it. Why come to the video that's praising it. If you don't agree with that point of view, just so you can give me a hard time, get a fucking life. Anyway, end the video. Great show. That's it.